Thank you so much. Uh, it really is a, a real, I feel it's a real pleasure, ple privilege to be here today uh, to, to give, have this opportunity. To speak. And I'd like to start by thanking uh, the sponsors for the talk today and, and my, my collaborators in, in some of the research over the past few years, especially uh, Marianne and Carrot Ken uh, Moriguchi and uh, uh, Mr. Konozan and, uh, never, of course, Ouchi san <laughs> Sorry, my Japanese is terrible, but uh, uh, it, it really is wonderful to be here. And, and of course, I have to uh, thank uh, all the other people, all of the other organizations that have made it possible uh, for me to do the research here in Japan for the past few years. And this slide is mainly to remind me uh, of, of the, uh, the funding agencies that have provided funding for some of this work as well as some of the key important collaborators, scientists, uh, both here in Japan and, and internationally, who have made it possible to do this research. Today, I, I, I plan to uh, share with you just a few highlights of, of the research we've been doing. <coughs> we have, we've written more than 80 scientific publications on Chernobyl and Fukushima for the past, over the past 10 years. Uh, and so I don't have time to, to talk about all of them. So I'm just going to touch upon a few of the highlights uh, and a few important new developments that, that I want to share with you. So we'll quickly start with a, a very brief review. Uh, as, as everyone in this room knows, the largest nuclear disaster occurred in Chernobyl uh, in 1986. Uh, vast areas of Europe were contaminated, including, of course, Ukraine and Belarus, Russia, but also Austria and Finland and Scandinavia and even parts of the United Kingdom were significantly contaminated. And, of course, the second largest nuclear disaster occurred here in Japan. Uh, almost five years ago. And everyone in this room is very familiar with most of the details of what happened. Uh, and, and as bad as the accident was, uh, it, we, we are lucky that it could, it could have been much worse. Uh, for instance, uh, last year we did an analysis of the weather patterns that occurred in 2011. And if the accident had happened at any other time of the year, the accident would have been much worse for Japan. So, so for this, we can be somewhat grateful. But it was still, of course, a very terrible and large nuclear accident. Uh, and we need to understand the consequences for both the environment and for the people. One problem we face is that some, some governmental officials believe that there are no significant consequences or no large consequences. As, as was stated, for instance, in the Chernobyl Forum report in 2006. And more recently, following the Fukushima disaster, the United Nations Committee for Radiation Safety, UNSCAR, suggested that, as for me as a biologist, uh, that the animals and the plants were unlikely to be affected by the radiation in Fukushima. This, uh, this is the UN Committee for uh, Research on Radiation Effects. And more recently, uh, the report from, to the Director General of the United Nations, uh, from the, uh, the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency, again repeating UNSCAR's suggestion that, that there would be no consequences of significance. But the, the truth is, at the time of these reports, we didn't know whether there were consequences. And so my research and the research of, of, of my collaborators is aimed at answering these questions of whether or not there are consequences for the plants and animals living in both Chernobyl and Fukushima. And so uh, my, my research team, uh, we have uh, been working in uh, Chernobyl since 2000 uh, and Fukushima since 2011. Uh, we've written lots of publications. Um, so as, as scientists, uh, we follow a very simple, logical approach to doing, uh, to answering these questions using the scientific method. Uh, and and I won't, we don't have to go through this. Uh, I've done it many times, but we basically follow this very simple method to get at the answers. If there's no genetic damage, then we can stop there. We don't have to be worried. So we've been looking at many plants and animals uh, to determine whether or not the radiation is causing genetic damage. And this is an example. Oh, sorry. This is this is an example of genetic damage due to radiation to a grasshopper. But we've looked at many different plants and animals. 
And this is a new result, uh, just published a few months ago. Uh, this was a, an analysis of all of the studies, including ours, that have examined whether or not there has been genetic damage related to the radiation in Chernobyl. And when we put everything together, all of these studies, uh, we find that there are very, very strong effects of radiation on genetic damage on most and plants and animals that have been studied. Uh, what, uh, what? Uh, this, this, is, is, this is really a very strong result, a very important result, uh, and, uh, and we think that the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency will be paying attention to this in the future. So, so now that we know that there are lots of genetic damage, uh, certainly in Chernobyl, most likely also in Fukushima, what does it matter? Does it mean anything? Does it have any effect? So uh, again, we've, we've looked at many different animals in many different ways, uh, and this is just one example, a uh, recent paper uh, from uh, two years ago, uh, documenting uh, high frequency of tumors, cancers, uh, and other abnormalities in uh, birds in Chernobyl. And, and some of you may have seen this picture before. This is a barn swallow. Uh, and uh, um, Tsubami, and uh, it's a very unusual color. And of course, many of the other birds also show strange white feathers in strange places. And three years ago, we started to see white feathers on birds in Fukushima as well. We think it is also related to the radiation. And of course, you've all heard about the cows. <laughs> I don't know if the cows are the same, that's, uh, that's unknown. But also many tumors and cancers. Um, and so, so many negative consequences of the mutations. In high radiation, the effects are large. In low radiation, the effects are very small. Another kind of effect that we've seen a lot is on male fertility. And, uh, unfortunately, the video is not working. Uh, but uh, we developed a technique to, to, to f get sperm from male birds without hurting them. So in Chernobyl, almost 40% of the males in the high radiation areas, they were sterile, no sperm. When we look at the morphology of the sperm, the shape and size of the sperm in the males, we find that the, the males from Chernobyl had a much higher frequency of abnormal sperm. And abnormal sperm are not very good for anything. It's not just the birds, but the insects as well. And maybe some of you have seen these photos before. This is a uh, firebug. It's a common insect in, in many parts of the world. And it has this kind of face mask looking shape to it. So it's very easy to see. The eyes and the, the nose and the mouth. In Chernobyl, in the high radiation areas, this is what we see. So again, very clear. Uh, signal of the effects of radiation and mutations. Here in, here in Japan, of course, there have been studies of the butterflies in particular showing very similar sorts of consequences. And, and I don't know what you've heard, but uh, these studies by this Japanese group in Okinawa are excellent studies, very good studies. The trees, the plants also show effects. A couple of years ago, we published a paper looking at the growth of the trees in Chernobyl as a, in response to the Chernobyl disaster. The tree growth has been dramatically affected, uh, both the shape and the amount of growth. Th these pine trees are supposed to be tall and straight, of course, but, but they're not. Some of you may s have seen this photo before. Again, it's a picture of the Chernobyl pine trees where they show the mark uh, of Chernobyl and where the growth rate was dramatically reduced. And it, Perhaps some of you have seen this recent publication from Japan, from some Japanese workers, showing similar kinds of effects on the trees here in, in, in the Fukushima region. So there's many similarities between Chernobyl and Fukushima in terms of these kinds of consequences for plants and animals. For me, as, a, as an ecologist, uh, as a conservation biologist, the most important question for me, though, is, is how are the abundances and biodiversity of animals and plants affected by the radiation? And, and, and to answer this question, we have, we have invested a lot of time in studying 
mostly the birds, but also the insects and the small mammals as well, in Chernobyl and Fukushima. Uh, in Chernobyl here in Ukraine and Belarus uh, in particular, uh, again, looking at the numbers of birds and insects at about 300 different locations. Here in Japan, we have focused mainly in the area uh, of highest contamination in Namiya, Hitate, around Kalamata, Minamisoma, but also down in Futaba, uh, and looking again at the numbers of different species of animals. So we, we've looked at numbers of animals at 400 different places, so so 400 points uh, for four years. The first year we only did 300 points, and then the next three years we did 400 points each year. Mm -hmm. So first year 300 points, and then so 2011 300 locations, and then 2012, 2013, 2014, 400 points. All right. Uh, he, he didn't seem to understand the uh, inventory, the meaning of inventory. Ah, uh, yeah. 500. Okay, inventory. So that's the, we go to a point, uh -huh. maybe, maybe here, uh -huh. and at that point we count all the birds, uh -huh. all the species, uh, some of the insects at that point. That's uh -huh. the inventory for that point. Uh, okay. Biotic. Uh, inventory to you. So th this is a very important point because we, we no one has done this. The importance of doing this is that it allows us, using statistical modeling and measurements of other factors in the environment, along with radiation and GIS, it allow, and statistics, it allows us to predict what should have been in a given place, what would have been there if there had been no radiation. This is a, a very critical part of the analysis because it's the only way to, to look at effects, to predict what the effects of the radiation have been for before and after the disaster. There's no other way to know. And, and we've written many papers for Chernobyl on this, the, re the results of this approach. Um, and uh, just this last year, no, earlier, yes, it's January, isn't it? <laughs> just last year, uh, in the last year, we've written uh, many papers uh, for Fukushima animals as well, uh, including these three papers. Uh, for Chernobyl, again, the, the basic result is uh, that the numbers of birds drops off by almost 66% in the more radio radioactive areas. And the numbers of species, the numbers of types of birds, drops off by about half in the most radioactive areas. For here in Japan and Fukushima, Again, this result is new of the last uh, eight, nine months. Uh, again, the numbers of birds drops off dramatically in the more radioactive areas. But of course, the effect is most obvious, most clear, in areas of right, quite high radioactivity, which is only in parts of Namiya and Itate and Futaba. And when we look at numbers of birds, the diversity of birds, we see the same pattern with a decrease at a given point, radiation. Again, it's, it's most clear when you look here above 10 microsieverts per hour, which luckily is a relatively small area. But <coughs> th this is the new, the new result uh, from just last month, just published one month ago, where we took, we collaborated with a group in France that specializes in radiation ecology. And what we did was that we constructed a dose to each bird in our study. Each individual bird, we reconstructed the dose. There were almost 7,000 birds in this study. And this is the first time this has been done. And what we find in Fukushima Based on conventional radiation biology, the same, the same information that UNSCAR uses and the International Atomic Energy Agency uses, we find that most of the birds are getting doses that would depress reproduction, that would affect negatively reproduction. And this is probably why the birds are going down in the areas of 
high radiation. I apologize for the graph, but it's a very important graph. What this graph shows uh, in, 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 in language that is uh, statistical language that, that governments understand, that the regulator, regulatory bodies understand, on, the, on this <coughs> axis is total dose, Num and total numbers of birds here. And as dose goes up, numbers of birds goes down. And notice that this is a straight line with not very much air. So what this means is that even a small dose has some effect. There, there is no threshold. <laughs> do, you, do you know how to say that? <laughs> it's a straight line. Okay. And, and this is just more technical stuff showing that basically half a gray leads to half of the birds missing. So with, with a dose, with a dose of one half of a gray, half the birds disappear. It, it, it's technical, I understand. So what about, that, that's birds, what about the mammals? We all want to know about mammals. We are a mammal, so we, we want to know. Uh, we, started, we started by looking in, in Chernobyl, uh, and we used uh, a very simple method to count the mammals using footprints in the snow. Any, anyone, what, what is this footprint? Anyone to guess? Yeah, it's a wolf. Okay. Oh. Oh. And yeah, they have wolves in Chernobyl. No wolves here. <laughs> when we look in Chernobyl, again, removing the effect of everything else and looking just at radiation, uh, very significant reduction in the numbers of mammals. When we look at rodents, very, very cute. <laughs> uh, again, dramatic reductions in areas of high radiation. I, I know there are television shows that say Chernobyl is thriving. There are many animals. Those television shows are not true. It's Disney. It's Disney. Cinderella. <laughs> so. We don't know what's happening in Fukushima. Uh, we, people are just starting to do research. And we have started to do research uh, with the mammals by looking at the rodents, but also looking at the larger mammals. You all know what this is, right? <laughs> Very famous Japanese mammal. How many, how many of you have seen one in the real, in the wild? Yeah, I, I was very surprised. Uh, I put camera in, in, the, in the forest, and he came to see me. <laughs> and, and of course, uh, again, many, many, many pigs, uh, wild boar, and of course, lots of monkeys. And uh, our fox. I think they can see the camera. <laughs> And look at this, Google! <laughs> Google's going through them here. <laughs> Very strange. Um, I was going to show you a few more photos. This a kogi. A kogi. A kogi. A kogi. I mean monkeys. Sarina. <coughs> so it looks like in many places uh, there are many animals. Right. It, it, it looks like the animals are doing very well. Everywhere you go, you see animals, especially wild boar. So the question is. Are they not affected by the radiation? Maybe the radiation has no effect on them. But the truth is, when you take people away, the animals behave differently. They change their behavior. So, so now when you go into Namiya, because there's no people, no hunting, you see many animals because the animals are not afraid of people anymore. In, in fact, in, in some areas, the wild boar have become tame. They, they, they like people because people have been feeding them. 
know. So uh, two months ago, we were driving through Namie, and uh, and a group of wild boar came out. A, a mother with with her children, as we were driving by, and they were very happy to see us. They were wagging their tail and you know waiting for us to give them some food. So so it might be easy to get the impression that there are many animals, but maybe there are not so many. And so the, 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 the issue, what must be done, is a scientific study that, that deals with all of these different variables. And so we've, we've started this study, uh, we started one year ago with 40 cameras uh, in different areas, and we're moving the cameras, and we're collecting all of the, the data from these cameras. And the first results are here. These results are not published yet, so the reporters should not put it in the newspaper. <laughs> but, but what it tells us is that there might be something important going on, because what we see uh, is that, of course, there's an effect of latitude, longitude, and how high you are, but also a very strong effect of radiation on the numbers of mammals in the area. And the biggest effect on the mammals is the effect of cleanup of the area. There are no animals where <laughs> there's cleanup operations. <laughs> the disturbance from the cleanup scares the animals away. <laughs> Not the radiation. The point being that people have a bigger effect than radiation. So just, just to finish up, uh, so we can go to questions. Uh, what does this all mean? What, what, what do our results mean? Ba basically, what it means to me is that there are many consequences of the radioactive contamination that are not being properly studied. I'm not going to go through this list. Uh, you can find it on my website. But basically, this is a summary of the findings that are published in our, in our papers. Basically, there are many examples of injuries to animals and plants at all different levels. The effects are large in high radiation and small in low radiation. <coughs> so what's next? What should we be doing next? Well, of course, I'm, I, I am biased. I'm a scientist. <laughs> so I think there should be much more research. My, my question, why is there not more <coughs> research being done? Opportunities for independent scientists, university scientists, academic scientists to engage in unbiased objective study of these areas. Uh, we need to move forward and we need to we need to be able to answer the questions everyone, all of you have. Is it safe? Is it safe for your children? Is it safe to eat the food? We still don't really know the answer to many of these questions. And I, I don't think the solution is making big piles of dirt. <laughs> and with that I would just like to again Thank you very much for all your help and, and translating today and, and, and with the research. And thank you again for, for coming today. It's been really my honor and, and privilege to be here. And I'd be delighted to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm so impressed with this report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So one, one of the reasons we do so much research with swallows is exactly for this reason. Swallows, as long as they are alive, they will come back to the same place to breathe. What we found in Chernobyl was swallows were very sensitive to radiation. And our results from Fukushima uh, support this. They, we find the same basic result. They seem to be very sensitive to the radiation. But the question was, do you release the swallows after you... Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. We, we, with, for the bird work, we, 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 we catch them, uh, we, sometimes we take a little, one drop of blood uh, to do genetic analysis, sometimes we take one feather uh, for analysis, and then we let them go, yes, yes. <laughs> it's easy to take, catch the bird. So in, in Chernobyl, it's easy to catch them. In Japan, it's much harder. Much of they're smarter. Nuclear right? <laughs> <laughs> um, is showed the effect of radiation uh, to the number of uh, animals and uh, species of animals. So uh, we are exposed to 
労働スレディエーションでデイリーイン福島、so is it uh, 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 do we have to uh, uh, is there any risk to be exposed to low dose of radiation in Fukushima? A very good question, important question, and and the answer is yes. Uh, that all all sources of radiation, but not just radiation, also other uh, oxidative stress of, of various sorts. The the main way that radiation affects animals and plants is through oxidative stress, as well as direct genetic damage. Sorry. <laughs> Let me start that again for the translator. Uh, so. The short answer is yes, it, we have to be worried about all sources of radiation, but, but the main source of radiation for most people in Western countries comes from medical sources, from x-rays, from CAT scans, <laughs> and so, so you have to be worried about all of these things. They all add together. Uh, there is uh, many places uh, where uh, radioactive substances is uh, uh, very high, uh, something like in Brazil. So, uh, but uh, we don't know. Uh, uh, there is no report that uh, in that area uh, the people are affected by a high level of radiation. So the answer is, we have studied that question as well. <laughs> and, and, and we, we have published uh, a review, I was trying to bring up, a, I was thinking of bringing up a quick graph for this result. We looked at uh, more than 5,000 studies uh, related to natural radiation and we put them together into a statistical analysis where we could look at whether radiation from these natural sources was having an effect. And the result was very convincing. Yes, natural radiation adds to the genetic damage, causes disease. And of course, many people, uh, certainly uh, in the United States and in China, they have done studies to show that radon gas from the ground, natural radon, is the second most important cause of lung cancer. So th there's no doubt that natural radiation also causes disease. <laughs> <laughs>
before believing everything you hear. It's just Japan. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's not simple. Uh, nothing is simple. The economic aspects, you know, the uh, world trade aspects. Uh, Olympics are coming. In a few years. <laughs> so it's not so simple. Uh, but but uh, and and we, we I think we see the same things everywhere in the United States also also in Ukraine. And it, it, it's, it's, I think uh, it's a form of censorship because most, most scientists, they only work if they get paid. <laughs> so, so if no money is provided to scientists to do research, then the research is not done. So, uh, so I, I was very fortunate to have some money for research that was not tied to any project. It was independent money. And, and I, somehow somebody convinced me it would be interesting to work in Chernobyl. And uh, we did that by independent choice. And, and the reasons were not related to radiation effects for me. It was not related. I, I, I was interested in evolutionary biology. Not radiation. But mo most of the research that's done is for either nuclear industry or for regulatory, government regulatory agencies. So it's not the same kind of study. Thank you very much and, and thank, you, thank you for coming. <laughs> yeah, it, it's not easy, it's not simple. Uh, you can't look at just one place at one time and get answers. So the best approach, the only approach, is to, to look many places, many species, many individuals for a long time to use the scientific method rigorously. We have, we have noticed in Chernobyl and Fukushima, some birds, no effect. Some birds go up, but most go down. For, for some of the birds that go up, we know it's because they have adapted, they've changed. In, in Chernobyl, it's been 30 years, so enough time for, for adaptation. And, and we, we think we know why, how, how they have adapted. We think it's because they have changed the way they use antioxidants in their bodies. <laughs> Sorry. その適応方法っていうのがアンタイオキシデントっていう方法らしいんですが、今調べてますので、ちょっと待ってください。抗酸化、抗酸化という機能があるんだそうですが、酸化する機能に合わない機能っていうことですか？So we hope we can use our results from Chernobyl to predict how birds will change in Fukushima, which birds will change. And, and this may even provide some ideas about how to reduce the effects of radiation for the other animals. Okay. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, um, my guess, my guess is, 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 is probably not, uh, because I've not heard this from anywhere else. Uh, you know, I, I, I get many calls from journalists. They say, uh, this fisherman, he caught this giant fish. It must be Fukushima. And, and, and uh, you know, the answer is, uh, it's just one fish and probably not related to Fukushima. あの、ジャーナリズム関係の方から、だからもう電話をいただくことがあります。私はあの、大きな魚を捕まえたんだけど、これは福島からじゃないかと言われます。単なる一匹だけで福島と結びつけるのは難しいことだと思います。I think it's it, like the animals in Fukushima where there's no hunting, where the animals go up, I think where there's no fishing, fish get bigger. <laughs> So it's important, I think, to be to be skeptical, to to be thinking uh, uh, before believing everything you hear. <laughs>
Yeah, you know, so so um, there there was one study done here in Fukushima on the monkeys. Unfortunately, uh, very limited study. The the monkeys were only from Fukushima City, not from Namiya, not from Izate. So, so the results were not strong enough to be completely convincing. But they did suggest that there was an effect on, on various aspects of red and white blood cell counts in the monkeys. And, and th the strongest part of the evidence was that it was the same finding that was seen for children living in Chernobyl. But I, 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 this brings up a point, I think, uh, that, that there's much information that could be learned uh, of very high value for humans by studying the monkeys in, in greater detail. But also the wild boar, too. And I, I think uh, Fukushima Medical University is doing some research with wild boar. Uh, excuse me, it's not Fukushima <coughs> Medical University or the Fukushima University. Fukushima Medical University. Oh, medical. Fukushima. I think that um, the makes a uh, mutation of chromosome, right? Uh, so is there any trend uh, of chromosome mutation in radiation? Related to radiation? Yeah, that, that, so, so the question, did you, maybe you want to say the question in Japanese? No. No. The, no he did say You did already, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah so, uh, uh, the, the first paper I showed uh, was, was uh, mostly genetic damage related to Chernobyl radiation. Very, very strong effects. Uh, uh, it, it, it's overwhelming. So yes, uh, the, 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 sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, Did maybe, uh, should I show the slide again, maybe? Okay. So, this recent paper, uh, it's uh, yeah, less, less than one year. Uh, we analyzed all of the studies that looked for genetic damage related to radiation. All, ki all different kinds of genetic studies. And Again, it, it's a graph, I understand, <laughs> maybe not so clear. But of all of the studies, these are all the studies ever done to test for genetic effects due to radiation in Chernobyl. And what this graph shows, so for, for this point here, this is the, the effect of the radiation, the size of the effect. And this is the error in the estimation, the uncertainty in the estimation. Lines. Yeah, it's the un uncertainty of the mean effect. So in these studies, very, very large effect of radiation. These studies, no effect of radiation. This, this one study suggests maybe positive effect of radiation. <laughs> Uh, I, I mean, uh, so uh, this one, this slide shows that uh, uh, radiation uh, affects uh, the mutation of DNA. That's right. Yeah. And uh, is there any trend of mutation, uh, or uh, does it happen randomly? Ah. Oh, good. Okay. 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 Uh, no, it's a very important question, and there's much research being done on that question uh, because it relates to medical issues like cancer and, and other diseases. And, uh, and so I think it's related to the ability to repair the DNA. Some, some parts of the DNA are much harder to repair than others. 
and so mutations are much more likely to be seen in parts of the genome where repair is not so good. Uh, so, so, so mutations are more likely to be seen in parts of the genome, parts of the DNA, where repair is not so good. Yeah, a very important point. And, um, and, and so, um, I think that's true. I think it's true. And, and one reason I think it's true is uh, because of observations we have made in Chernobyl. So we've discovered, uh, not just us, uh, a group of scientists have discovered that animals living in the wild, the wild of Chernobyl, are ten times more sensitive to radiation than the same animals living in the laboratory. So we've discovered, uh, not just us, uh, a group of scientists have discovered that animals living in the wild, the wild of Chernobyl, are ten times more sensitive to radiation than the same animals living in the laboratory. What's ten times more? Ten times more sensitive. Uh, and we think it's because in, in, in nature, in the wild, <coughs> They're, they're very stressed. They have to find food. They have to avoid being eaten by something. They have diseases. They have yes, they know those who are built. And th this, this finding, uh, relatively recently, uh, it was three years ago, this was discovered. And so uh, it, 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 is, it will change the way we regulate radiation exposure. So the short answer is yes. I think that's important. <laughs> Would you say that the last sentence again? <laughs> what did I say? I cannot read. <laughs> uh, about regulate. Oh, regulate. So, so we, we think uh, this 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 finding uh, will change the way that uh, laws and rules are made of regulating uh, radiation exposure. Yeah. So so again, it's it's never simple. Um, uh, so the simple, the short answer is, each CT is 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 on average six and a half millisieverts exposure. A recent study from Australia uh, looked at that all of the CTs done uh, in Australia over many years and found that there was a significant, a small but significant risk even from one CT. <coughs> However, the benefits of having a CT probably, in most cases, are more important than the extra risk from the radiation. So it depends on how sick you are. But what's, what's important is that we know what the risks are. Have you seen the, the Australian study? You should read the, the, the study from Australia. Yeah, uh, we, we don't have enough information to, a to answer that. We, we, we think we know from all of the research that's been done on radiation effects that it seems very likely that the youngest uh, are more the most sensitive. Uh, but from our data alone, we don't have enough information. I, I understand the little ones are better to eat as well. <laughs> Seriously, uh, wild boar, pigs, uh, because they they like to eat mushrooms, and because, and because mushrooms accumulate cesium, wild boar often have very high levels of contamination. So even in Germany, right now, today, the hunters can't eat one in three wild boar they cannot eat because the cesium from Chernobyl is still too high. You know? uh, yeah, n nothing is simple. Nothing is simple. Uh, I, I, I think you you uh, you look at the alternatives. You look at the range of possibilities, 
and, 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 and you consider all possibilities and you find the one that makes the most sense. Uh, people tend to simply take the one, uh, the most obvious one, rather than looking at everything that's possible. Uh, that's the only advice I can say. <coughs> yeah, I think that's uh, an extremely important point. Uh, most of the effects, uh, especially for humans, uh, are likely to require uh, ten, uh, 20, 30, 40 years. I and that's just for the cancers. <coughs> uh, in, 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 in truth, the, the largest effects, uh, or the most significant effects, are ones that we probably will never measure. We will never measure, at least not very well, and that is just overall health. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very difficult, uh, cha it's a very challenging uh, uh, problem to, to assess the, the overall effects. We, we focus on cancer because we can diagnose it easily. Uh, we know what it is, uh, and it kills people. But there are many other health consequences that are much harder to measure and quantify. So in, in, the, in the animals that we study, we find that the, the lifetime is shorter. They're, they're a little more asymmetrical. Uh, they, they're, 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 they're not as capable. They're not, they don't perform quite as well. But it doesn't kill them. And so how do you say that? <laughs> so it, it, it's not... I, I guess it's, uh, it's the effects of mutations uh, and genetic damage uh, and other effects of radiation uh, often don't lead to cancer. They, they simply reduce performance. Yeah. yeah, so they can't run as fast <laughs> or they can't fly as well or, or they're not as attractive to, to a mate because they're a little asymmetrical. So many... <laughs> <laughs> Hard to translate, but we, we, we don't want to get caught up in details, I guess. It's just, it's just uh, the effects are, are general. Does that make sense? <laughs> it's, uh, so, but the other part of the, qu the question is that we need to do the studies over many years, for many years to come, to continue the work. From where you are right now, what kind of studies would you like to see performed? Also, what kind of resources would you need? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Yeah, so your imagination is the only limit. There's so many, so many aspects of the environment, the biological environment that have, you know, have not been touched. It, it only, or it touched, it's been very superficial. There, there's so much more that we need to know. But my personal interest is, is, is the genetic consequences. Uh, in terms of resources, uh, <laughs> uh, because, because I enjoy coming to Japan and I enjoy the question, uh, for a little resource I will do a little research, and for a lot of resource I'll do much more. <laughs> The, the more serious question, though, is how much should be invested in this area, and that's a that's a very important question, and 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 I think it's important to reflect on how much is being spent on moving dirt, how much is being spent on uh, other aspects um, of the disaster, and how much yeah. is being spent on environmental studies. So th this is why I, I I think of this. Uh, lack of resources, the fact that there are no resources. I consider this modern censorship. Do you think that citizen science, like volunteer forces, would be a very significant help? What do you again? Volunteer oh. forces. Uh, volunteer. Uh, to help, like, volunteer helpers. Uh -huh. um, citizen science. Citizen science. Uh, it, it's absolutely critical, and, and certainly I could not be doing the work that I'm doing without the help of many citizens, <laughs> both yeah. small and large. Uh, without without the help of my host uh, with place to live and my 
<laughs> interpreters and other facilitators, uh, none of this research would have been done. So at that level, it's very important. In the more formal sense, uh, there are ways to involve citizens to help collect data over large areas. And, and there's been some of this in, in uh, Japan uh, related to radiation measurements. So the SafeCast group. Uh, have, have, you, have all of you heard of SafeCast? But there are many other kinds of information that can be gathered with the help of citizens. Right. So for instance, Mr. Kono, uh, who has a house in, in uh, Namie, uh, has, has helped for conducting research uh, inside the zone that would not have been possible. And, and I, I found Mr. Kono because of connections through Imanaka-san, through <laughs> So both formal and informal citizen science interactions are important. But hard science is very expensive. Uh, it's much more than individual citizens can pay for. So, so hard science, hard science, you know, genetics and biology. Very, very so only only governments can pay for it. So so another way that citizens can help is by telling their elected representatives that this science is important and it must be done. It's difficult. <coughs> uh, you know, and, uh, uh, So, oh, very good question. Um, so, in general, in general, it's not possible to tell that a cancer came from radiation. It's gen in general not possible. But there are some diseases, some cancers, that are very rare, occur very infrequently, and are known to be associated with radiation exposure including childhood thyroid cancer. And, and another example is childhood leukemia, which is much less common, very rare. But when it, when it occurs, it's almost always because of radiation. But the, the, the fundamental problem is that cancers, even thyroid cancer, is still very rare. So even when it increases many times, it's very hard to see statistically. And th this is why there's still so much discussion about thyroid cancers in Fukushima. Is it real? Is it radiation? We don't know. But we, we will know for sure in in, in two years, maybe three years. But, but I, I, I agree that there should be more investment in other approaches for analyzing the effects of radiation on genetic damage. But at, at this point in time, there's no money for research for low-dose radiation uh, effects in the United States or in Japan, right. anywhere. Right. My, my hope, my hope is that all of this study of thyroid cancer now in Japan will lead to new information uh, that will make it much easier, much, much more, uh, much, much easier to diagnose the cause of these cancers for future accidents. So there, uh, <laughs> there are many uh, similar animals in Chernobyl and Fukushima, and so I think we can make predictions uh, for the ones that are the similar types. Uh, actually, in the birds, there are 14 species of birds that are the same. In Chernobyl and Fukushima. So we can make some predictions on the basis of genetic relatedness between species. But more fundamentally, we, we, we think we have discovered how, how they have adapted 
in the, for the birds, it's, it was the species who could change the use of melanin. Mel melanin. Melanin? Melanin. Change the use of melanin for... So, so in birds, they use melanin for colors, dark browns and black colors. But they also use the precursor to this melanin, uh, an antioxidant called GSH. So it makes melanin, but it also defends against radiation. So some species change GSH to defend against radiation, but they lose coloration. <laughs> the, the species that can change this, they have adapted. So we would like to test test this idea scientifically. Probably. I, I, I don't. We don't know. <laughs> uh, but it, it's it's a good question. Uh, it seems it seems likely. It seems likely. Uh, things stress works together, uh, often multiplicatively, synergistically, and so it seems it seems likely that the weak would be most affected. But weak in what way? You know, it's hard to define. <laughs> but as I w what I was trying to say earlier was that radiation effects tend to be, uh, they tend to affect performance. Uh, so say, for, for a bird, how, how well it flies, for instance. And so if, if there's radiation effects on flying ability, maybe it will be eaten. <laughs> or if it's, if it's a male, bird, it will lose the fight for the female bird. We'll, we'll never know. So, for instance, just just to start, <laughs> uh, you know, we have not been able to do most of the experiments that we've done in Chernobyl. We have not been able to repeat in Japan. And, and fundamentally, science requires replication. You must repeat the experiments in different places to prove, to support your hypothesis. And and. and from, again, from a science point of view, we have an opportunity in Fukushima to learn so much about the effects of radiation. And it's not, it's not being done. So for, for me, I, I would go, <laughs> I, would, I would start by doing some very rigorous studies of the birds and the rodents catching them, taking blood, doing genetic work, behavioral work, work on the sperm, uh, all of these things that we've done in Chernobyl but have not been able to do in Japan. But I think the most important thing we could do uh, for this science is to provide an opportunity for young scientists to come to this field, to come into this field, to, to bring new young minds who are interested in, in this question, who think it's important. Not, not just old men, <laughs> but it's, it's very expensive, again, to, to bring PhD students and postdoctoral students, young people, uh, to get them involved. It costs a lot of money. But that's where most of the answers are likely to come. Yeah, I, th I think uh, part, part, of the, part of the answer is that I'm getting old and slow. <laughs> I started in Chernobyl 15 years ago. And to be honest, for the first five years in Chernobyl, it was impossible. Uh, we had to break all the rules. 
But I only went to jail once for that. <laughs> uh, Russian jails are not very nice. Uh, which is one reason we started working in Belarus and Ukraine and not Russia. But the, the more important answer is that in Ukraine and Belarus, they, they were very interested in these questions. They wanted answers. And we were willing to come and try to do the research. And so they helped us. Yeah. I, I, I'm not a medical doctor. Um, yeah, so uh, probably best to talk to uh, a medical doctor about those specific kinds of questions. Now, are you asking how to check for radioactivity in the body or the effects of radioactivity? So I, I, I think if there's you know a risk of exposure, continuing exposure, if uh, if if, if, li if living children are living in a contaminated area, then, then certainly there are ways to check whether they're getting a dose by wearing a dosimeter and, and by getting whole body burden counts. Uh, and urine tests too, of course. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not a medical doctor, so I, it's much better that I don't answer. <coughs> I, I go back to the, uh, the, the one of my first slides, uh, which uh, I think I think we were very lucky here in, in Fukushima. I think we were very lucky because the disaster could have been so much worse. The main source of contamination, uh, we're lucky because the main source of contamination here is cesium. In Chernobyl, it's cesium, strontium, plutonium, neptunium, plutonium, titanium, americium. So many parts of Chernobyl, there's no chance that it will recover anytime soon. In, in Fukushima, the areas of high contamination are relatively small, and they will get smaller and smaller each year. And they will get smaller and smaller each year. It's important, I think, to be to be skeptical, to to be thinking uh, uh, before believing everything you hear. Uh, but that that that's the best I can say. <laughs> so so this is uh, again a, a very very difficult question. Uh, it is the the most important question related to nuclear energy uh, in one way or another. Uh, the spent fuel, either from a disaster or from every nuclear power plant, is, is a problem that has not been solved anywhere in the world. And, but again, uh, I'm, I'm not a, an engineer or a physicist, <laughs> so it's, it's probably best that I don't uh, give my opinion. Uh, it's not well educated, but uh, the uh, it's it's a it's an insoluble problem. There's no solution to this problem. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I, I had I was going to mention this in my talk, but but time was you know short, so uh, I, I can talk for hours, <laughs> but sometimes I have to stop. But the short the short story is that uh, we, uh, we first discovered in Chernobyl that many of the birds in high radiation areas had cataracts in their eyes. We, we, we were actually, we were inspired to look for the cataracts after reading the literature on atomic bomb survivors who also had cataracts. We have a new paper uh, to be published one or two weeks from now that will show cataracts in the mice, the rodents in Chernobyl. We, we, have, we have started to look for cataracts in the mice from Fukushima as well, but we have no data yet. We, we, we would like to look in the birds as well, but we have not. We need to get a big grant first. Uh, the brain size? So once once again, uh, we were inspired by results of atomic bomb survivor studies that showed that 
children who were exposed to the radiation while inside their mothers often had smaller brains and, and cognitive problems. And, and we looked for this in the birds of Chernobyl and we found that Chernobyl birds had smaller brains. It's known that nerve tissue is more sensitive to radiation than other tissue. We will have a new paper in maybe two months, three months, showing smaller brain size in the mice as well. Also in Fukushima. But we need a grant to look at the birds in Fukushima. <laughs> but I, but I, I hope that's not too depressing. So. <laughs> but I think my brain might be a little smaller now too. <laughs> Well, oh, I should speak to you in English, I'm sorry. You know that I'm from Hawaii, and so I really feel bad about all this radiation that's going to the ocean. And uh, because, you know, we live in an island, islands, uh, and although we are kind of far away, I wonder what kind of effects we have. Yeah, Hawaii, is it going to go to Hawaii? Hawaii no ho ni mo, yabai ho ni mo, so then mo, mo atte ikut ni desu ka? Do you know anything about that? <laughs> so, so yes, it's going to Hawaii, uh, and it, it, it's already arrived in Canada and California. People are very concerned about this, uh, but but uh, the lucky they're very lucky. <laughs> they're very lucky because it's 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 a very small amount. It's important, I think, to be to be skeptical to to be thinking. Uh, uh, before believing everything you hear, uh, but but uh, the lucky they're very lucky. <laughs> they're very lucky because it's 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 a very small amount. It's important, I think, to be to be skeptical to to be thinking uh, uh, before believing everything you hear. That that doesn't mean it's it's good. It's it's not good, but uh, it means it's much better than it could have been. But in, in the United States, they are not spending money on research either. <laughs> so, so they don't know for sure how much is coming. It's important, I think, to be to be skeptical, to to be thinking uh, uh, before believing everything you hear. But I but I I hope that's not too depressing. So <laughs> but I think my brain might be a little smaller now too. <laughs> It's important, I think, to be to be skeptical, to to be thinking uh, uh, before believing everything you hear.